All right, time for football at four. John McMullen's with us at JF McMullen, 97.3 ESPN.com. And, John, Jenkins didn't last long. He is back with the Saints. Now, are you aware of the terms by chance? Do you, have you heard anything on the terms? No, I haven't uh, seen the terms yet. I've been doing some other stuff here uh, behind the scenes. A lot of uh, started the new league year uh, stuff coming in, but – um, it's no surprise that New Orleans, I mean, Sean Payton has been really, really uh, clear with us in the past. And he said one of his biggest mistakes as a coach was letting uh, Malcolm Jenkins out of the building the first time. So uh, it doesn't surprise me that now he got a chance for the mulligan and the do-over uh, that he jumped at it because he has – had and has tremendous respect for Malcolm Jenkins. Okay, so if the if the what contract would it take for you to say why didn't the Eagles just do that? Well, I, there's been this crazy uh, narrative that Malcolm wanted top of the line money, fourteen to fifteen uh, million dollars a year. Uh, I, I've talked to him about this a number of times, and he's always understood. Uh, at least on the surface, he's verbalized it, that uh, he wasn't going to be among the highest paid safeties in the NFL. He just wanted to be, uh, felt he outperformed his contract and he he wanted the adjustment uh, to be in that neighborhood. So I looked at, you know, where are you between basically almost 8 million to 14, 15 million, somewhere in between. So 10, 11 million, um, I, I think. Uh, he would have come back to the Eagles uh, under that uh, type of contract. So I have to believe uh, the Eagles didn't want to go that high. Yeah, so, uh, like, we were kind of kicking around, look, what if he did two years at $28 million? I mean, you, you, that $14 million you're saying is not accurate. So two years, $22 million, you know, something like that. Would that have been like, eh, that's still too much? Or would, would you have been comfortable with that? Personally, I would have been comfortable with it. Obviously, the Eagles wouldn't have been comfortable with it. Okay, so and you think they, they were not happy? They were not going to be in that two-year, twenty million, or something like that range. No, I don't. I don't think so. It's a very difficult decision, and they made it. Uh, and look, I've said it in the past. A lot of the things that made Malcolm great at this stage of his career uh, at thirty-two are now hurting him. The fact that he never misses a snap. I put the numbers on 973ESPN.com. I forget the exact number. It's like 2,073 snaps over two years. Didn't miss one defensive snap uh, over a two-year period. Five of the six years he was here, he played over 99% of the defensive snaps. And you talk about all the injuries. All we've talked about with the team is injuries, it seems, for three straight seasons. This guy is out there every single play, never mind game. As I said, never mind practice. He doesn't miss a practice. You know, one of the underreported things of uh, that whole jockeying with Andrew Sandejo is how much Dave Zip respected Sandejo. He was the personal protector uh, for Cam Johnson on the punting unit. Uh, when they cut him to ensure they would get that extra compensatory pick, who stepped in as the personal protector? Malcolm Jenkins. I, I mean, this guy did everything. Well, and how much of it, John, is this team has been decimated by injuries. He's the one guy that's avoided of it. It's only a matter of time before it gets him to. Yeah, I mean, that's your thought process. Uh, and more than, but more than that, I mean, you can't legislate injuries. I, I always say that. I don't, I don't think people in the league think of it that way. They don't say you're a ticking time bomb. They're, they're not, they don't think Malcolm's going to get hurt. Uh, they're not using a law of averages thing. It's more of what I said yesterday, the tread off the tire. Uh, he's just played so much. You expected the scent to happen. And, and to be honest, to be fair to the Eagles, the the sand has already started. He's not the player he was two years ago. And uh, a lot of that is the toll uh, that's been taken on his body. Um, 
So it, it is a difficult decision, and I see both sides of it. But at some point when you have a player like that, and I, again, the bigger example is Tom Brady, New England. They finally moved on. I've talked a lot about guys in baseball, Derek Jeter wasn't very good at the end of his career. But for all he did to the Yankees, they said, you know what? <laughs> Keep going as long as you want. Uh, we've talked about with the Phillies and Chase Utley and Jimmy Rollins, Ryan Howard, how long they stuck with those guys. Sometimes you, you pay for what's in the rearview mirror, and you kind of understand there's going to be a little bit of a downtick. I thought the Eagles were going to do that. They decided not to. I support the move by Howie Roseman if they continue to go with this whole getting younger philosophy because that's the blueprint they laid out for the fans and for the organization. But then I, I look at something like cornerback, and they clearly need help in that area. And you hear the names like Chris Harris, who's 30 years old, Slay, who's getting to 30 years old, True Font, who's 29. At what point, like, that's the route they're going to have to go. So at what point is it they are getting younger – and they also need to attack guys who are close to 30 years old. Like, do you believe that is the proper way to approach this? Or do you think that they should go in the draft, get these 20-year-old corners, and put them in, throw them in the fire, and have them gain experience, also like a Sidney Jones? Well, I, 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 they already have young corners. So I, I, I don't know if that's the way you want to go and just add on top of it. It would be nice to as I mentioned yesterday, to develop the guys you do have and maybe a different set of eyes and Marquand Manuel will help to do that. Who knows? But uh, when you say get younger, uh, it doesn't mean it's not, it doesn't mean your every move you make is going to be youth oriented. I, I mean, it is, it is the NFL. You have to have some veterans. Uh, and the Eagles tried to get Byron Jones. They tried to get Trey Waynes. I, uh, found that out today, which is not good. Uh, they begged out on both because it got too expensive. Um, and, you know, if you get down to plan C or plan D or plan E or whatever it ends up being, well, maybe you don't have valuable young corners any longer. And you have to go in a different direction. So the theme of getting younger it is true, but it's also not meaning every single move they are going to make has to be a young player. That's just not realistic. Right, exactly. So we had a guy call in earlier. He said, you know, what about Jimmy Smith? And, of course, our both default answer is, well, he's 31 years old. That's not the direction they want to go. But do they look for that stopgap veteran guy? Because they're going to need two corners, right? Unless you're playing on going with Sidney Jones and Russell Douglas on the outside. You would have to think they're on the lookout for a veteran corner. Yeah, I, I still expect him to bring a corner in, a veteran corner at some point. It may be forced down. And, and if the market comes down for Chris Harris type, he's still a good player, but is 31, is aging, and in theory is not what you wanted. But, uh, again, if the numbers come down, would you rather have Chris Harris at, 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 a, at a viable $8 million than Trey Waynes at $14 million? I would, even though I want, to, I want the younger guy in theory. So, you know, sometimes, uh, again, you can have an over, overall formula and you want to stick to it as much as possible. But I, I often point out there's 31 other teams in this league and they don't care what your plan is. And they have their own plans and they're going in a lot of instances for the same players. So you're never going to get everyone you want and everything fit perfectly from the, the, the plan you formulated in some office. And that's what differentiates the good organizations from the bad organizations. Uh, when the curveball comes, yeah. the ones who do a good job with it are, are the better teams. Now, it, it, it happens to everybody. What do you think, uh, Troy Rennick from uh, Denver reporting that the Eagles are indeed pursuing – Chris Harris. Now, they didn't get Jones. Does that mean we still need to find a guy who is our top corner? So does Chris Harris, uh, it would it be a surprise if they were able to figure out a way to do that? Real quick, Josina Anderson is reporting Chris Harris to the Chargers. Okay, well, we'll take that out. <laughs> so, I guess that's out of the mix. 
Yeah, and, and, and but it is just as I said, and, and everybody is, is looking towards the Falcons made it official uh, with Desmond Trufant, um, and he's going to be a post-June 1st cut uh, from their perspective, uh, designated as such in, in the history with Manuel. Again, he's not the player you wanted. He's not the player. The player they targeted was Byron Jones. They couldn't get him. So it it, it goes that you'd go down the list from there. Mm-hmm. I'm sure Chris Harris was on that list yeah. at some point. So who's left but on that Chargers list? Chargers probably went too high, and, and the Eagles, my guess, would be begged off again. Who's left on the list that, that they would be interested in? Well, you <laughs> just about everybody because they have such a dearth at that particular position. Logan uh, Ryan? Unfortunately, uh, Logan Ryan would be in that conversation. You know, one guy, a lot of people talked about Waynes, I just mentioned, uh, from Minnesota. Mackenzie Alexander is also a free agent from Minnesota. Now, he's been a slot corner in the past, but a lot of people project uh, that he could be more than that. And he's coming off his rookie contract because he played the nickel, because he technically wasn't a starter, even though, um, let's face it, nickel cornerbacks in this league are starters now. Um, he, he's a guy who's young and is going to be a little bit undervalued and, to be honest, is better than anything you have outside. So uh, there are names to be had out there. Uh, And the second wave of free agency, we always talk about it, uh, that's where the values are found. In the first wave, you kind of know, it's kind of built in, you're going to overpay for guys. And you've seen that. When you see $17 million for Byron Jones, you see $14 million for Trey Waynes. I forget what Bradley Roby got, but I remember going, wow, Bradley Roby got that? Uh, To go back to Houston. James Bradbury, fifteen million. You want James Bradbury for fifteen million? I, I don't know. No. I, I don't. I, I, I mean, I, I'd rather I'd rather wait for the second wave and for the value and a guy like Alexander. I, I mean, and I have no idea if the Eagles are even interested, but I, I would think that would be a better deal. Uh, than any of the names I just mentioned. Yeah, uh, John McMullen, football at four, at J.F. McMullen, uh, here on the Sports Best. By the way, Eli Apple, uh, corner signed with the Vegas Raiders, so the, he's out of the mix. Yeah, he's a four he's guy, yes. so everybody said, well, maybe you bring him back. But anyone who's seen him play, no, I'm out you on don't him. want Eli Apple. No, out <laughs> on him. Um, all right, so a couple of quick things here. Uh, now we know uh, – so – all right, the dust is settled. Jenkins is out. They brought Mills back. They brought McLeod back. They brought a defensive tackle in here. Where does Howie Roseman focus next, in your opinion? What's the next free agent? Or do they say, you know what? We're just going to wait this thing out. We'll go to the draft and see what happens. No, they're going to sign a number of bodies in free agency. I'm very confident in saying that. But it is going to be the second wave. Uh, they are obviously uh, – I think now probably waiting for the bargains, the more bargain type players. Um, receiver is the one position. It's pretty clear. They said they looked at that and said, outside of Mari Cooper, a there's there's not really any difference makers on the receiver market now. Stefan Diggs is the Andre Hopkins, but that's the trade market. Uh, but when you talk about guys like Robbie Anderson, I, I mean, those aren't difference makers. Uh, and they see the draft, and, and it's probably the deepest receiver draft in 20 years. Uh, they're going to they're gonna wait for the draft to get their receivers. Everything else, as I said, they need bodies yeah. uh, everywhere. So they're going to sign guys in free agency. This thing is it's 48 years old. I, I understand the impatience of everyone, well, but – like you what? Know, it's not I just go out and get ago. my own. It, it's not that long ago where you can look at even Rodney McLeod, Brandon Brooks. They weren't first day signings. There were a couple days down the road, and then if you go to the Super Bowl season and the Chris Long, Patrick Robinson, all those, like Garrett Blunt, that's second tier free agency. You mentioned the drafting and the wide receivers, and that's probably where the Eagles are going to look to get their guys, which totally makes sense to me. 
But because of letting Malcolm Jenkins go, and Mike and I kind of talked about this yesterday, does this now change drafting something else besides a wide receiver in the first draft, in the first round in the draft? Because wide receivers are so deep, maybe you can get a second, third round talent that's still a great wide receiver, but you can go out and get a corner or a safety in the first round. Yeah, I don't know if the Eagles can be that luxurious, so to speak. I mean, if you look at their recent history at, at the receiver position, the fact that Nelson Aguilar was a first-round pick and J.J. was a second-round pick last season, I, I don't think this team, this team can sit around and wait. Uh, if anything, they probably have to go up and get the receiver they really, really do want, uh, especially now that uh, Minnesota uh, traded Diggs, and now it's 22 and 25. So they're going to go get a receiver, probably. Yeah. Um, so I, I think they have to be proactive at that position. They've made it clear. Adam Schefter was on today said that's the reason they didn't they bowed out on DeAndre Hopkins because they loved the draft so much, which is another story because there is exactly a zero percent chance the wide receiver they get will be DeAndre Hopkins. And I'm going on record, 0.0. So none of that makes any sense. But they got to get a receiver. They got to get him in the draft. They got to get him in the first round. They can't mess around. Uh, Real quick, Nick Foles is heading to Chicago. Does he beat out Mitch Trubisky, and does that make them a playoff team again? Uh, yes and no. Uh, he's already beat out Mitchell Trubisky. <laughs> you don't bring in Nick Foles, and even though he's restructured his deal at, at that price, he's the starring quarterback. And you see the history there, John Filippo's there. Uh, but also Bill Lazor's there as the offensive coordinator. Matt Nagy has a history with him, the head coach. So everybody knows Nick. Look, I joke P.J. Walker would be a better alternative than Mitchell Trubisky. So oh, Nick is going to be the starting quarterback. Uh, does that make him a playoff team in that division? No. I mean, Green Bay is still Green Bay. Uh, Minnesota is probably not as good because they've taken so many hits in free agency, but they're still a good team. So Nick Foles is Nick Foles. He's a mediocre quarterback. If everything goes right, they have a chance to make the playoffs. All right, uh, football at four. Johnny Mack, of course, uh, like all guests appear via the Boardwalk Honda hotline, and uh, you can follow him on Twitter at JF. Uh, we will find out who quarterback in New England. We'll talk about that on tomorrow's edition and uh, plenty more. All right, pal. All right, thanks, guys. Yeah, Johnny Mack here on the Sports Bash. So we'll keep it here for just a minute or two. Um, see, the the interesting part is, the lack of interesting names at corner. So they just say, you know what, we'll stick with one of the guys we have, whether it be Sidney Jones, Russell Douglas, let them battle it out in camp. Maybe we can make a trade once we get to camp and we'll draft a guy in the first round and that'll be, you know, the one side. You know? Oof. Oof. I don't know how I feel about that. I really don't. Is it but the Sidney do Jones that has you oofing or is it the Douglas or both? I just feel like it is very similar to this Nick Pavetta, Vince Velasquez thing. How many years are we going to do this? I feel like there's more potential in Sidney Jones than Rasul Douglas, but it, it to me, it feels like the same thing. Sidney Jones is the Nick Pavetta. There's potential there. We're not getting it out of him. Vince Velasquez is Rasul Douglas. You know, they can't get out of the fourth inning. It's the same thing every time. I, I just, I, I guess I'm over the same two guys and rolling with that every single year. That's a fair point. It's like, hey, how many times? Now, let me ask you, like, you know, we had the caller earlier. I like Sidney Jones. I feel it's unfortunate the injuries he has had. But can he be the guy that we're wrong about? Sure. I guess there's a chance. And the injuries, it's like every single play, there's a hamstring issue. There's a hamstring problem. So he's got to stay on the field. And even when he is on the field, he's getting toasted. Now, he is young. So to answer your question, yes, he made it two, is possible. He made a couple big plays on like the one play that he was in on each game. He was like, yeah. where is this coming from? I don't I don't know. It's it's possible. And that's why it's Nick he is the perfect example of, of Nick Pavetta. It, it's the perfect 
cor- like not correlation, but comparison. That's the word I'm looking for. The perfect comparison. It, it's like the stuff is there. He has the ability to, but it's not consistent enough on the field. And that's the problem. So if Nick Pavetta gets traded and goes to the Yankees, is he striking out 10 each game and, and being a, a third starter? Probably. If the oh, Eagles give on. up Sydney Jones. <laughs> Probably. As he goes to the Patriots, uh, is he going to be a lockdown corner? Probably. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah, probably.